So, um, good. So as I said, this uh, means for our theorem here about um, bit sizes, it suffices to show this, you know, one statement number one, that when you have a list system of inequations and the bit size is L, takes L bits to write down your input, then uh, assuming there is a solution, there's a rational solution that can also be written down with poly L many bits. Okay. So let's think about how to prove this. Try to draw a picture here. This is uh, Rn. Well, I guess n is kind of like two on my slides, but it's like Rn. And here we have like three inequalities depicted and their intersection is not empty. It's this triangle K. Okay, so the first thing that I want to claim is that when K is not the empty set, so there are at least, you know, there's at least one point inside K, then um, there's always a feasible, not just a feasible point X inside, but a feasible vertex, which I'll call X star. And what is a vertex? It's like a corner. Uh, so this is an example. It's, uh, you know, one of these corners. If K is like a polytope, you know, it's like a vertex. It's like a corner of the polytope. And um, this is actually not true due to like a little annoyance, but we'll come back to this stupid annoyance later. So just for a moment, prove that this is, assume this is true, because it's true in essentially all cases, or in the nice case. Okay, and um, these vertices, which are also called extreme points or basic feasible solutions, are very important in the theory of uh, linear programming, which is why I guess they have a threefold um, synonyms here, vertex, extreme point, basic feasible solution. These are all kind of the same thing. Um, and in fact, we're going to reason about uh, not only will there exist, you know, a solution X with polynomial bit size, but actually one of these vertices, in fact, all of the vertices um, of all the corners will have polynomial bit size um, needed to write them down. So what is a vertex? Remember in this picture, right, um, you have a bunch of M linear inequations in your uh, your initial k. And um, if you turn the inequalities into equalities, then you get like a half space. These are sort of depicted by these white lines over here in the diagram. These are half spaces and the, the inequalities are the half spaces. And we're in n dimensions. So a vertex is really, what it means is it's the unique solution of some n linearly independent half space equation. So if you think of like an inequality as an equation in your mind and view that as defining a half space or like, yeah, an equality, um, you know, we kind of know unless modular, modulo annoyances, if you have n equations in n unknowns, then there's modulo annoyances, you know, a unique solution. It's true when they're linearly independent. And uh, these are affine half spaces, by the way. And uh, meaning they don't necessarily go through the origin. There's a non-zero right-hand side. And these uh, solutions are these vertices, like the corners of K. Okay, so in this picture where N is two, these yellow lines, which are your half spaces, they intersect here. Two lines, two uh, um, in two dimensions, they intersect at this vertex of K. And therefore, uh, it means that this vertex here, or any vertex, X star, is the solution to an N by N system of equations, like a subsystem of the M in equations that you're given. You view them as equations, and then the vertices, like this vertex, is the solution to an N by N uh, system of equations. And um, this means that the, the solution, this vertex X star, can be written down with polynomial in L, you know, many bits. And the reason for that is basically because, you know, solving systems of equations is a polynomial time algorithm. You know, we have Gaussian elimination, you take some rational system of equations and variables and knowns. Um, any one, such a system that defines a vertex, uh, you solve it and you get a vertex. And, you know, since it's a polynomial time algorithm, you only have time to output polynomially many bits, which means that X star, the vertex, can be written down with polynomially many bits. I still have this uh, quotation marks here, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, actually, I, I just want to mention that I'm a little bit alighting some complications here because, in fact, the fact that Gaussian elimination is in polynomial time is a pretty non-trivial fact. 
It's proven by Edmonds in 1967, and it needs a little bit of sophistication. Uh, it needs Kramer's rule. So the you know the algorithm you remember from linear algebra class, it you know takes polynomial steps in n if you're solving an n by n system for sure, n cube steps maybe. Uh, I have a question here. The question is, what is Gaussian elimination? Gaussian elimination is the you know classic algorithm that you learn in linear algebra class for solving um, like an n by n system of equations. Usually you kind of just, uh, Gaussian elimination refers to the algorithm you take, like the matrix for the equations, and you kind of, it's kind of similar to Fourier Mutzkin, like you kind of clear out, uh, you know, a whole column, you try to eliminate uh, the first variable, and eliminate the second variable, and so forth. So basically it's the algorithm you learn for solving systems of equations. And um, yeah, this, as I said, this, you know, involves n squared or n cubed steps or something. Um, but the thing that's annoying is uh, checking, you know, these rational numbers that you generate as you go along that they don't, you know, blow up and require exponentially many bits to write down the numbers that are generated. Uh, but it's true. Um, and uh, perhaps you'll see that on the homework. So let's just take that for a given that if I give you a system of n variables and unknowns, all the coefficients are rational, you can solve it in polynomial time. And so the answer is polynomially many bits uh, to write down. Okay, any further questions about this? Does it make sense? Okay, uh, so what's this annoyance that we need to come back to? Um, well, the annoyance is that um, sometimes there are no vertices. So here's a perfectly valid uh, linear program. N is two, and the number of any equations is one. It's just like X1 plus X2 is greater than or equal to one. You have one half space. Uh, here's the feasible region. It's everything above, you know, to the northeast of that. And there's no vertices. It's just a, it's just a line. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, if you have vertices, if K has at least one vertex, then you can conclude that it has, um, you know, this vertex can be written down with polynomially many bits, and you conclude that there's a polynomial size solution. But you could have these, like, terrible... Um, uh, LPs with no vertices, but the only way this can happen is if like they're unbounded, which is a perfectly normal thing that can happen, uh, but we want to get around this. So uh, the preceding proof would be fine about vertices and so forth if K always included what I call big box constraints. This is not a real term, uh, but it's just a term I made up for this lecture. What are big box constraints? I say uh, you have quote, unquote, big box constraints, if your linear uh, program, your set of equations, also includes, for every variable, xi, a two-sided equation saying xi is between negative b and b, where b is like some really big number. Okay, it's like saying, oh, I, my linear program is k, but plus, like, all the, I only want to worry about x's that are inside a gigantic cube of side length 2b. Okay, and b... Uh, the kind of Bs I'm going to be thinking about are ones whose representation size is polynomial in L. But remember, that means that B itself, like if B is an integer, its actual magnitude is 2 to the poly L. Uh, but that's okay, because you write it down in base 2, so uh, the number of bits needed to represent it is poly L. So uh, we're going to like it if you have big box constraints, because if you have big box constraints, then... Um, um, you know, like this, then even if your original k were like unbounded in some directions, you know, the fact that you have a big box forces the intersection of k and this big box to have some vertices. Okay, so what I want to show is basically whenever you have a linear program k uh, with bit complexity l, mm, you can sort of, without loss of generality, put in big box constraints for uh, a big value b um, that takes polynomial and L many bits to write down. Okay, and once we show that, then all this argumentation about there exists a vertex is true, and therefore there exists a rational solution that takes polynomial many bits to write down is true. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? Um, oops. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. And uh, 
Yeah, what's nice about this is these are give you always give you n linearly independent equations. If you can imagine converting them into equations, they just look like xi equals b and xi equals negative b. You have one for each variable, so it's kind of like you have you know n linear independent equations, which is another reason you'll be able to find you know n linear independent equations making a vertex. Now. I want to show you that you can always add these big box constraints. And it almost seems like I'm making like a circular argument here because um, you know, this is sort of what we were trying to reason about in the first place, that we were trying to reason that you could a priori sort of only worry about um, numbers that are at most polynomially many bits large. But uh, you know, I'm going to show you how to make it non-circular. So in order to do this, I have to talk about um, converting a linear program of the type we've been interested in before, just with all in equations like this, which is called standard form linear program, to an equivalent program in uh, what's called equational form. And an LP is said to be an equational form if there are basically no inequalities, you only have equalities. Well, that can't quite be right because, I mean, then it would just be a linear system of equations, but uh, you have all variables constrained to be non negative. So equational form is a special kind of LP where you have only equalities, but you insist that all the variables be non-negative. And what I'm going to show you now is that given any standard form LP, you can convert it into an equivalent equational form LP, okay, where it's like easy to go back. So they have the same satisfiability status, and it's easy to go back and forth between a solution for one and a solution for the other. OK. So how are we going to do this? This is just um, some simple tricks for converting this to an equational form. So uh, trick number one is in K, the xi's, the variables, are not constrained to be non-negative, but they're supposed to be in this final version K prime. Uh, the xi's are not constrained at all, per se. They're just involved in the inequations. But this is no problem. The trick here is the following. You take each variable xi, and you replace it with two variables called xi plus and xi minus. Well, you don't replace it with that. You replace, you introduce two new variables, xi positive, xi negative, and you replace xi with their difference. And you see, if you plug, you know, this into some inequations, it turns one inequation into another inequation, just in twice as many variables. And you are going to constrain xi plus and xi minus to be non-negative in your final k prime as needed. And this is why it's valid. It's just valid because you know, any real number can be written as a difference of two non-negative real numbers. Regardless of whether the initial real number is positive or negative or zero, you can always write it as the difference of two non-negative numbers. And conversely, the difference of two non-negative numbers has no particular constraint on its sign. So this is a valid move. Uh, oops, okay, so good. So that, um, takes care of this aspect. The other uh, problem, um, besides the, the variables not constrained to be non-negative, is that you know, your constraints are in equations, and they're supposed to be equalities. Okay? And the way to get around this is also pretty easy. You take in each in equation like this, you know, like this a dot x is greater than or equal to 0, and you replace it with a dot x minus b equals s. Uh, and this s is called a slack variable. It's a new variable that you introduce. And, you know, we see it has to be constrained to be non-negative. So indeed, si is constrained to be non-negative. And now but you see that this equation with the new slack variable, you have one of these for each original inequality. This new equation, together with the constraint that the slack variable is non-negative, is equivalent to the original inequality that said, you know, a dot x is at least b. It's the same as saying a dot x minus b is non-negative. Uh, good. So if you put these two fixes together, it does the job. It converts this k that has only inequalities to this k prime that has only equalities, but with all the variables uh, non-negative, constrained to be non-negative. Any questions about this? Okay. Okay. Good. So let's go back here. Uh, Right. So what I've told you now is that we can take any standard form LPK and convert it to an equational form LP that's equivalent. And let's write this equational form LP in a bit of a simpler form. 
Uh, oh, let me just also remark that you can obtain k prime efficiently from k, and you know the number of k prime is very similar to k. So the number of bits you need to write down k prime is probably linear in the number of bits you need to write down k. They're polynomially related. Okay, so we can when we're given k, remember what are we working towards here? We're working towards trying to show that given any feasible LP, or even infeasible LP, any LP, you can sort of, without loss of generality, put in these big box constraints without affecting satisfiability. And what I'm just showing you here is, you know, given K, you can just uh, convert it to equational form and think about that. Okay, so let's write K prime a little bit more briefly. So X is, we're gonna call the variables X now, even though really they're, you know, it's like the XI plus and minus and also the S's, but I'm going to kind of forget all that and just say, okay, let's just call the new variables x and the new b is b. And so, yeah, an equational form LP looks like this. It looks like A is a matrix here. So it looks like AX equals B. That's your bunch of equations. And x greater than or equal to zero. And this is a shorthand for the coordinate wise statement that each of the components of x, x1 through xn, is greater than or equal to zero. We're going to continue again to call the number of variables n and the number of constraints m even though it actually changes a little bit when you go from standard form to equational form. Okay, so let me uh, simplify this a bit more. Okay, and now once you get to equational form, or once you have an LP in equational form, you can make a few other simplifications or a little observation. So uh, let's say A is M by N. You know, there's N variables and M constraints. And another thing you can assume without loss of generality is that A has full rank. So if you remember your linear algebra, what does this mean? It means uh, each equation is linearly, I mean, the linear equations are linearly independent of one another. No equation is, you know, a, a non sorry, is a linear combination of other equations. Like no equation is automatically implied by other equations. So all the equations, you know, are linearly independent. They stand on their own. And this is without loss of generality because if you have some like redundant equations or equations that are applied by other equations, you can just eliminate them from K prime and it won't change K prime's nature. Um, so we can assume without loss of generality, and an algorithm can actually algorithmically do this efficiently if it wants, again, by basic linear algebra stuff, Gaussian elimination again, in fact, or row reduction type stuff. So we can assume that A has full rank, and so actually the number of rows of A will be less than or equal to the um, number of variables, okay? You'll have N variables, and you'll have either, you know, one, two, three, four, five, dot, 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 N equations, or some uh, value M between one and N. And so this AX equals B, this is like a subspace. It's an affine subspace. And K prime is saying, you know, K prime is like everything that's on this subspace. Um, I'll draw a picture in a second. Uh, we, where all the coordinates are non-negative. Okay, so uh, I'll draw a picture in a second. But now let me just say, I want to show that once we're in this equational form like this, whenever, you know, K prime has a solution, you know, it has a solution where the bit complexity is not too big, and therefore we can equivalently add these big box constraints. Okay, so here's a picture. I'm gonna to try to draw a picture when n is three. And right, so in k prime, you have this non-negativity constraint. So all your solutions should be lying in this non-negative orthant. I don't know if it's supposed to be, you're supposed to imagine that like the, you're sort of looking at the origin, the non-negative orthant is like close to your face. Um, Okay, and then what the picture looks like depends on what M is, like the number of equations involved in K prime. So let's imagine in case one that M equals N. So you have like N equations and N unknowns and they're linearly independent. Okay, in that case, K prime is just a point. It's the solution to the N equations. And K prime being feasible or, you know, satisfiable simply means that this point is in the non-negative orthant, like all its coordinates are non-negative. Uh, so you're right, this point is just the solution to A x equals B in this case. And, you know, just for these reasons we talked about, you know, since solving a system of equations can be done in polynomial time, the solution to a system of linear equations can be written down with polynomially many bits. So in this case, where your equational form solution has M equals N, um, your solution will have polynomially many bits. And therefore, it's okay to take, you know, B to be a number that's a bit, you know, that also needs can be written with polynomially many bits, like an integer that's like a bit bigger than the maximum possible uh, solution to a system of 
equations in your uh, your LP is. Okay, does that make sense? So I want to argue that like if you you have an LP in equational form, maybe you've converted to an equational form, and you got rid of the redundant equalities. If you have you know n equalities, then the solution provided exists is inside a big box, but not too big, one that can be written uh, where the side lengths can be written with polynomially many bits. Okay, so case two, what if m is n minus one? Well, in that case, you have n minus one equations and n unknowns. The solution to that is a line. It's like an infinite line. And then k prime is like the intersection of this infinite line with the non-negative orthand, which, you know, the line might or might not pass through the non-negative orthand. That's uh, the question of whether k prime is satisfiable or not. It has a solution or not. But if it does, um, then the picture sort of looks like this. If you can try to imagine what I'm drawing here, it's like a line piercing the non-negative orthand and making like a line segment. It'll at least be a half infinite segment, if not a finite segment. Um, what I want to argue is it has to hit at least one of the coordinate planes, the three coordinate planes, x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, x3 equals 0. You can imagine if it's, this line is exactly parallel to um, one of the axes, like it might hit only one coordinate plane, assuming it does hit the non-negative orthant. But there's no way like it can hit the orthant yet like miss all the coordinate planes. So what I'm arguing there is um, the algorithm doesn't have to know this or anything. An algorithm doesn't have to know this. But whenever you have a feasible k prime like this, where m is n minus 1, so you have this uh, line that does pierce the non-negative orthant, it has to hit at least one coordinate plane. And therefore, there exists some equation like xi equals 0 that you can throw in, hypothetically, without changing satisfiability. But once you've done that, you've reduced the case of m equals n. Okay, and the solution is just a point. It's the, the solution to the whole system of equations together with this new xi equals zero. So again, you know, yada, 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 you can, the solution with this xi equals zero will be expressible with polynomially many bits and the big box thing is okay. Okay, and this generalizes. So if m is n minus 2, then k prime is the solution to n minus 2 equations and n unknowns. It's like a two-dimensional flat intersected with the non-negative orthant. And again, there's no way it can hit the non-negative orthant without hitting at least one of these coordinate planes, xi equals 0. And therefore, again, you can throw in at least some equation in the form xi equals 0, which gives you like a new equation, and it reduces m to n minus 1. And then you can like inductively argue that you can reduce from m n minus 1 to m, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, what I'm trying to say is no matter what actually m is, whatever the rank is, if there's a solution, then there's some fixed b, integer b, with polynomially any, many bits that you can write down, bigger than uh, any output of Gaussian elimination or a linear system solver, that's sure to include at least one feasible point. Okay, so the summary is given a system of inequalities k with bit size l, its feasibility is unchanged if you add these big box constraints where b has polynomially many bits. I think even quadratically many bits is sufficient. And um, this even, uh, now we've proved it when the LP is in equational form, but it follows kind of immediately, if you just think about how equational form and standard form were equivalent, but it's also true for the original standard form you can put in these big box constraints without changing satisfiability. Okay, and in light of this, what we can conclude is that when k, a given, you know, LP without these big box constraints, k is given, if it has a solution that in fact has a vertex solution, and this vertex can be written down in polynomial size, and if it's empty, there's a proof lambda and the dual, uh, and the proof can also be written down with polynomially many bits. Okay, and this actually formally shows that linear programming in, is in NP intersect co-NP, if you remember your complexity theory. Any case, I mean, as we all know, and we will show later in this class, it's in fact in P, but now we're sort of fully warmed up to the fact that it has the potential to be solvable truly in polynomial time. Any questions right now? <laughs>